You can start, sir. Sorry? You can, you can start. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me just start sharing the screen. <clears throat> Okay, good morning to all of you. So we'll uh, start off from where we left off yesterday. And uh, yesterday we sort of uh, ended by looking at uh, the evidences for uh, a supermassive object in the nucleus of an active galaxy, uh, which may be powering the radio jets. And we talked about line widths where uh, given the widths of the lines and the distance from the center, just from the varial theorem or just balancing forces, you can see that you need uh, masses of the order of a billion solar masses or so. And as I mentioned that we have black hole, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, which range from about a few million solar masses to about 10 to the power of 10 solar masses or so. We also saw that uh, we could arrive at uh, the masses of the objects from variability arguments, causality arguments, where if RG, which is the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole uh, or, or, or any object given by 2GM by C squared. And you can see over here that from the time scales of variability, you can also try and infer a mass scale. For small mass objects, the time scales are very rapid and you can see flickering in X-ray sources in our galaxy. Whereas if you had much more massive objects, for example, 10 to the power of eight solar masses over here, then the variability time scales would be longer, about a thousand seconds or so. And similarly, as you go higher in masses, you'll get longer time scale just from causality arguments. Then we also have to contend with the fact that these jets carry a huge amount of energy and uh, the luminosity of a source is typically, I've just taken a canonical value of 10 to the power of 46 Earths per second. Now, how do we understand these huge luminosities is something we'll deal with first. Then we look at uh, jet sidedness, and then we look at some of the observational evidences that the launching of a jet, uh, the presence of a supermassive object, and also the presence of an accretion disk are all intimately related and look at some of those relationships which might be relevant for launching of these, uh, of these very high velocity relativistic jets in active, in active galactic nuclei. So yesterday I noticed later that some of you had asked questions in the chat, which I'm sorry I managed to overlook, but we will uh, take those up as well at the end of this lecture uh, because some of the questions you may find answers in uh, today's lecture, okay. Now uh, let's get on to uh, let's get on to the source of energy. Now, why do we why do we need uh, we, we need a very efficient process of generating the huge amount of energy? Uh, in fact, when quasars were first discovered, that there were doubts cast on its cosmological redshift um, because the implied luminosities were very large and one was not sure as to how to generate such huge amounts of luminosity from a very small region, right in the center of a galaxy or in a quasar, a star-like, what appeared to be a star-like object in the sky. Now, accretion onto a supermassive object provides 
a viable means of trying to understand the generation of large, large values of energy. So we'll just try to go through that briefly in a few minutes. And uh, I'll make this uh, sort of PDF file available to you all so that you can look at it at more leisure. Uh, because time is short, we will go through that rapidly. The physics is very simple. Okay, consider the accretion of matter onto a star of mass m radius r. And as you know, when matter is falling from infinity, it will acquire kinetic energy. And as it becomes more tightly bound, its potential energy becomes more negative. And if you consider a proton of mass mp falling from infinity, your kinetic energy and potential energy will be related by this, by this expression. And imagine that it is hitting a hard surface, the surface of a planet or, or a hard surface. Then at r equal to r, there'll be a very rapid deceleration. And the kinetic energy of free fall will be, will either go into internal energy or will be radiated away as heat, which, and this is what is believed to power the extra sources. For example, when a neutron star is accreting matter from a binary companion uh, via its Roche lobe overflow, flow matter falling in through its Roche lobe, that, uh, that it, is the, it is the matter which is falling onto a very compact object and gravitational potential energy is being converted to heat that is believed to believe to power the X-ray sources in our galaxy, for example. Now I can write down the luminosity as a rate at which mass is being accreted. Okay, and then I can express this in, by using this expression for v free fall squared uh, from the earlier expression to express the luminosity in terms of the mass infall rate and the mass of the object which is accreting and the radius of the object which is accreting. The Schwarzschild radius of any star can be, which came from the solutions, the static solutions of Einstein's equations for a black hole, but Rg is equal to 2gm by c squared. So it basically depends on the mass of the object. For the sun, it's about three kilometers. For the moon, it will be in the millimeter scale. And, and uh, and rest are constant, the gravitational constant and the velocity of light. So often you'll find these expressions expressed in terms of the Schwarzschild radius, okay? And so I thought I'd just introduce it over here. Now you can see over here that L can be expressed as half Rg upon R, dm dt c squared, okay? Now I can express this half Rg upon R as a kind of efficiency factor. So L is equal to psi dm dt c squared, so xi is a measure of the efficiency of conversion of accreted matter into heat. So as you can see, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the expression for xi, it inversely varies as the radius of the object. So the smaller the radius, the higher the efficiency you will get. So for example, for a white dwarf star, which is a few thousand kilometers or so in radius, you get factors of about 3 to 10 to the power of minus 4. So when you get to a more compact object like a neutron star, which is about 10 to 15 kilometers or so, then the value of the efficiency goes up to about 0 0.1 or so. And you can see this is much more efficient than the nuclear reactions which are taking place in the interior of a sun, which is given by about 7 into 10 to the power of minus 3. So you can see that accretion onto a compact object can be a very efficient way of producing energy, which we see in these radio jets. Now, we, could we do even better if matter is accreted onto a black hole? Black hole is a singularity, but the problem lies that if matter is falling radially onto a black hole, then it'll just go through beyond the event horizon and you'll lose it for good. There's no information from, the event, from, from, closer, from within the event horizon that is going to reach you. So now, so how, does we, how do we extract energy out of a black hole? Now, uh, what happens is that in, in practice, in falling mat matter, we'll have angular momentum. And because of this, it tends to form a disk around the black hole. And matter can fall into the black hole if it loses its angular momentum. So what happens is that some of the angular momentum will be, will, will, my material will spread outwards, carrying some of the angular momentum, some of it will fall, fall it inwards. And this is achieved by viscous forces in the disk. So viscosity acts as a frictional force, which results in the dissipation of heat. And one can calculate, which I've not done over here, 
that for a Schwarzschild black hole, it's about 0 0.06. So it's still much more efficient than that of nuclear reactions, which is 7, 7 to the power of minus 3, as we saw. But when you go to a rotating black hole, you can also extract energy from the rotation of the black hole. And for a maximally rotating curved black hole, you can see the efficient goes up to a staggering value of 0.42. So accretion onto a black hole provides a, a viable process of trying to generate these huge amounts of energy. So uh, as we saw that uh, L is equal to xi, xi can you know, maximally rotating black hole, this value of xi can be about 40% or so. So this is higher than any other processes that we are aware of, uh, including nu nuclear reactions, which are taking place in the interiors of stars like our sun. Now, if you look at this expression, you can ask yourself the question that if I keep increasing dm dt, can I get extremely large values of n? I keep increasing dm dt, so L should keep increasing. And does that work? The answer is that does not work because if the luminosity is too great, then radiation pressure will start acting on the infalling material. So you can work out, which Arthur Eddington did many years ago, of trying to balance the inward force of gravity with the outward pressure, or we can relate the forces, uh, due to radiation. And in this case, uh, in the vicinity of the black hole in the center of these galaxies, it's a reasonable assumption to make that the matter is fully ionized. So the pressure would be via Thomson scattering. So you can consider for the forces on an electron-proton pair. Uh, matter would be ionized. You can't have large-scale charge separation. So Thomson scattering would be for efficient with the electron, but electron and proton would be close together. So you can write down the uh, expression for the gravitational force, which is nothing but gm, mp plus me upon r squared. And because this is much smaller than the mass of a proton, you could write this down as gm, mp upon r squared. And then you can calculate the force on an electron-proton pair due to the photon flux. So each photon will give up a momentum, which is p equal to h nu by c, and how much it gives up in one second will depend on the incident flux of the photons. And an incident flux of the photons will in turn depend on the luminosity of the object. Okay, So you could write down the force on the electron-proton pair as the Thomson scattering cross-section, the photon flux, and the momentum it gives away per collision, which is h nu by c. Then the flux density of photons you can calculate from the luminosity which is the luminosity L divided by 4 pi r squared h nu, all right? So you can work out the force due to the luminosity of the source. Now, if accretion has to stop, then the force due to, um, due to the photons striking the electrons will have to balance gravity. This, these two forces have to balance. And then you find that the maximum luminosity which you can get is given by 4 pi g capital M mass of the proton C upon sigma t. So what you notice over here is that the Eddington luminosity depends only on the mass of the central object. The rest are all fundamental constant, whether it be the gravitational constant, the mass of the proton, or the Thomson scattering cross-section. And if you put down the numbers, this is, these are the kind of numbers that you will get. Uh, so if you can calculate Eddington luminosity is 1.3 into 10 to the power of 31 m upon m sun into watts. So if you want to express it in ergs per second, which we have been doing, is 10 to the power of 38 ergs per second. So if you want to produce 10 to the power of 46 ergs, you do need about 10 to the power of 8 solar masses or so. So, so you can see that to generate these large quantities of energy, which the jets are carrying to these outer lobes, uh, you need a supermassive object so that gravitational, like a black hole, like a supermassive black hole, uh, which will convert the gravitational potential energy into other forms, into radiation, accelerating particles, etc. Uh, and, and that forms the most efficient way of extracting energy is from a rotating black hole. And, and, and you do need masses of the order of 
about you know, 10 to the power of eight solar masses to produce about 10 to the power of 46 Earths per second. We will not get into too much of details about Super Eddington and all that, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of luminosities that you're dealing with. Now the accretion disk will also be threaded by magnetic fields, but right now we are looking at a very simplistic scenario of just electron, proton, or probably heavier ions as well, and uh, which are present in the accretion disk and radiating by via thermal processes. So using that, we can also go and estimate what the temperature of the accretion disk should be. And that is, I can do it very easily to try and just equate the luminosity equal, uh, equal to the Stefan Boltzmann's law, four pi r squared sigma t to the power of four, which you would have learned from your basic thermodynamics. And you equate that to the Eddington luminosity. Now you can see over here that t to the power of four, r squared. So if r is small, uh, you would get high temperatures for a compact object like a neutron star or a white dwarf. So you can see that for solar mass neutron stars, the temperature is of the order of 10 million degrees Kelvin if you plug in the numbers over there. So at 10 million degrees Kelvin, as you know, will radiate in the X3 region of the spectrum. So, so <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, this provides a viable explanation of accretion onto neutron stars from a companion star, and the temperature is in the right ballpark by just doing the simplistic calculations of equating the Stefan Boltzmann law over here to the Eddington luminosity, which is the maximum luminosity which you can get by accretion by balancing the force due to gravity with sorry, force due to gravity with the uh, force due to radiation, okay? Now, uh, if you go to white dwarfs, white dwarfs are larger in size, so you'll get a lower temperature. And that is what you see over here. So white dwarfs are, are, are part of systems which are cataclysmic variables, but we'll, we can overskip the details as if you've not been introduced to it. But for supermassive black holes, there is something else interesting which happens. And that is because the radius itself, which is the Schwarzschild radius, and you can sort of uh, equate that, uh, try and get the last stable circular orbit, the innermost stable, innermost stable circular orbit, and, uh, and uh, which is three times the Schwarzschild radius. So you can see the radius itself depends on the mass. Okay, but larger the mass of the object, the larger the radius of the object. So when R comes below over here with mass on, on this side, that you're actually dividing by mass squared over here. So that is why this temperature depends inversely on the mass of the object. Because the more massive the object is, the further away is, are the, uh, is the material uh, which you, from which you'll see radiating. So if you take a 10 to the power of eight solar mass black hole over here, uh, that's that will be 10 to the power of 8 raised to the power of a quarter will be 10 squared. And so you'll get temperatures of the order of 10 to the power of 5 Kelvin. Similar to that of the uh, white dwarfs over here, although it is much, much more massive. And so if it is 10 to the power of 5, you should be able to see some signature of it in the, in the continuum spectrum from a black hole. And this is just one picture which I have picked up uh, from a paper by Collison et al. recently. And you can see the accretion disk is the red uh, dotted line over here. And this is the accretion disk over here, which has been modeled. It will not be all of one temperature. There will be gradation in the temperature in an accretion disk. And that is why this doesn't, when you add up all the different components and the temperature structure, this is the kind of curve you will get. So you can see this is often referred to as a big blue bump. And that provides a, another piece of evidence I mean, although people have toyed around with alternative explanations, this provides another evidence that there is an accretion disk associated with a supermassive object lurking in the nuclei of active galaxies. So right now, before we move on, I will take, um, I'll, I'll sort of take a little break to take any questions from y'all from what we have done so far. I'll also look at the chat today and yesterday's chat will take up along with today's chat. 
So any questions from what we have uh, done this morning? You can unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Junik, you can ask, uh, you can unmute yourself. Uh, one second. Uh, sir, uh, I actually have a question. Is that uh, the super, the super uh, jets are mostly related to the acquisition process. I mean, the acquisition process provide, can provide most of the energy that is uh, required for those jets. So is it that the jets are coming from this accretion disk or is it from the inner part of the black holes? I mean, okay, from... okay. Uh, Junik, actually, I will come to that in the say in the third part of today's presentation. So you reserve your question till the end, and if you're still not clear, we will try to address it at the end of today's lecture. Okay, yes, sir. because yes, that sir. is something which I will touch upon, but not get into too much of details, uh, because it's, uh, the formation of jets is a complex uh, issue. But at least I will hint to where things are coming from, and we'll take up your question at the end. Okay. 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 Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Okay, Abhijit. Abhijit, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, Hello, go ahead. Sir. A, a small, uh, I mean, query. Yeah. You said, you said the, uh, uh, during the accretion process, the um, you know, it, it is because of the energy is uh, liberated because of rapid deceleration. Yeah, it's gravitational potential energy uh, yes. of accreting matter, which is uh, converted into heat or other yes. forms of energy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, when a black hole is accreting, yeah. uh, uh, the matter will be accelerating inwards. I mean, yeah, actually, angular momentum will be conserved, have to be conserved. So, viscous okay. forces will actually spread out a disk with some material falling inwards. And that is what actually both uh, calculations as well as simulation show that some of the material will be falling inwards, okay, and some of the material will be falling, will be moving out. And it's a material which is falling inwards, which will actually, you know, you, the closer you can get to the black hole, uh, the more energy you can extract out of the infalling material. And you'll find that the horizon shrinks in the case of a rotating curved black hole, and you can get a more efficient uh, output of energy from that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Welcome, yeah. Uh, so, Jotirma, you had a question. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Good morning, sir. sir am I audible? Uh, you yeah, audible, Jotirma. Sir, uh, in case of it may be silly question. Uh, in case Sorry? of this white white dwarf and uh, neutron star, yeah. this uh, neutron, new, uh, fusion reactions are no longer undergoes. Uh, so then, uh, how? Uh, they are in thermal equilibrium means how they maintain their temperature? Uh, actually, they will cool. They will cool. Um, here I talked about a neutron star which is accreting material from a surrounding. But for example, you can you can calculate uh, the cooling time of a white dwarf. All right. Uh, the time scales are very long, but uh, but these stars these stars when there is no further generation of energy from the nuclear region, it will start cooling. White dwarfs will start cooling as well. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on now, and uh, we will look at the next uh, next section. I will keep an eye on the time so that I also have time to answer your questions. Now we'll ask ourselves how fast are the jets moving? All right. We will try and do that for about uh, fifteen minutes. I keep mentioning that uh, they are relativistic jets. They are they, they are moving. And it consists of uh, uh, most likely electrons, highly relativistic electrons, and protons as well, because overall charge neutrality you got to preserve. Uh, some of these very high luminous, high energetic uh, uh, emission at gamma rays, which you see, there could be relativistic protons involved as well, uh, and there could be electron positron plasma present as well, um, uh, and in which case you will get proton emission from the uh, from the plasma as well, electron positron plasma. Okay, but now we'll try to see how we could actually try and measure. Uh, can we get an estimate of how fast the jets are moving? And that has that, that we'll see as is also related to the possibility that the jets in these in at least a large fraction of these high luminosity sources appear to be one sided. Okay, and that is something which you uh, asked yesterday. And uh, and uh, uh, about the one-sidedness of jets, and we will try to um, uh, try to address it as well. 
Uh, there's a question or the consequences of Hawking. Okay, um, actually, there's a question from Saura Upare. So let me just take that very quickly. Uh, he's worried about uh, uh, worried about Hawking radiation from black holes. Actually, Hawking radiation is negligible in these cases in these supermassive black holes. Hawking radiation may have been significant in very, very small, tiny black holes, which may have formed earlier in the epoch, uh, evolution of the universe, but we don't have any observational evidence for it. So Hawking radiation is a possibility, but there is no, uh, but, but it, is, it is extremely small and, uh, and we have no observational evidence for it right now. And, um, and we believe that the matter, because it is normal matter, which is being accreted onto the supermassive black hole. So it is most probably just electron, proton, heavier ions uh, that are being sort of accreted onto the supermassive black hole. Okay, so we will, uh, We'll keep uh, sort of looking at the chat periodically, but I'll try and take up most of the questions in the end. Now, let's see, uh, for example, uh, just to quickly show you, uh, visit our old friend MHE7, which we met yesterday. And you can see that uh, the jets are highly asymmetric over here. And they're asymmetric, not only on the large scales. This is about, um, you can see that uh, uh, this is hundreds of parsecs, but even if you go to 20 parsec scales, if you go to half a parsec scale, if you go to you know, 0 0.05 parsecs over here is the scale given over here. Uh, the collimation angle differs. You can see it starts off with a large, uh, you know, larger outflow angle than what you see over here, which is much narrower. So there is a zo zone of collimation of for these uh, jets which are squirting out. And this is, of course, the event horizon telescope image of the black hole itself. Okay, the orientation has been slightly different over here, as you can see, but we'll try to ask ourselves a question as to how fast these jets are moving and what relevance it might have in terms of understanding their asymmetry. This asymmetry, just to show you another example, this is a giant radio galaxy, which is more than a million parsecs across. As I said, one parsec is 3.26 light years. And here is a scale of one megaparsec, which is given. So whether you take in the kiloparsec scales or the parsec scale, the jets are usually on the same side, appear on the same side, and they're usually one-sided when they're, when they're not, uh, not symmetric. Now to measure the, uh, measure the velocity of the jets, what you got to do is something very simple. Uh, you measure the position and you note how, and um, keep measuring the position year after year after year, see how fast it is moving. Uh, to, to see how fast it is moving, you measure the distance which it, it has traveled divided by the time, all right? So you can do that because the motion is very small. You can do that only for the nuclear jets because these are very compact on the, on the scale of milliard seconds or less. And, uh, and you can see this is, a, this is a milliard second scale jet of the first quasar 3C273. And I can measure this in say, you know, every year for about 10 or 15 years and look at the motion of this object and infer the velocity. And this is what has been done. Uh, these are somewhat old pictures, but when they did that, they came out with velocities which were much greater than the velocity of light. So that remained a puzzle uh, initially, was a puzzle initially, but it soon got resolved by a very clever idea from Martin Rees, which originated in one of his papers in 66. And the, and the very and the simple idea is as follows. This is one more example where one of the inner knots of M87 also seems to be moving out or inner knots at velocities which are greater than that of light. This, and the idea is very simple that if you have a component which is moving towards you at nearly the velocity of light, okay, uh, at nearly the velocity of light, then what you will see is as follows that you can in its you can see that in time t will travel this distance, but how will it appear to you? Okay, I'm ignoring cosmological sort of velocities over here, but just looking at the motion of a plasmon from the nucleus of an active galaxy coming towards you. Now this distance which you'll measure would be v t sine phi. Phi is the ang angle of inclination of the jet axis towards the line of sight. And along this axis, the distance this travels is Vt cosine phi, right? Now, whenever you measure distances, you will measure distances in the projected onto the plane of the sky. So although this object has traveled a distance Vt, Vt what you will see is only traveling, having traveled a distance Vt sine phi. 
smaller the angle, the smaller the distance it will appear to travel because of projection effects. And you can calculate the velocity by dividing this distance by the time which you will see between the emission of the plasmon at one location versus another. And the time which you will get would be, for example, suppose there is a wave front which is emitted here that will come towards you at a velocity c. And then there'll be another wave front which will be emitted from here. And effectively what happens is the time interval would be this distance divided by the velocity of light, all right? And that is, so what you can see over here is that the time interval is getting squashed because the plasmon which is emitting, which is, is almost keeping up with the wave front. This can only happen if it is moving at a very high velocity and also coming at an angle which is small to the line of sight towards you, okay? For example, if it is moving at a velocity of 0.99 C, at an angle of five degrees to the line of sight, the apparent velocity you will get is six times the velocity of light. So it is not in its rest frame or in the rest frame of the object moving at superluminal velocities, but it is appearing to travel at superluminal velocities because of its small angle of inclination and a velocity which is a high fraction of the velocity of light. So what this tells you is that the jets are moving at highly relativistic velocities as they squirt out of the nucleus. They may be slowing down further down, but when they start off, they're moving at highly relativistic velocities. What also happens in these cases is that, uh, is that uh, uh, due, to, due, to, uh, due to its relativistic motion of, of the object coming towards you, and when you incorporate the uh, uh, Doppler corrections due, uh, corrections due to the relativistic motion, you will also find that the observed flux density, okay, gets enhanced compared to what it would be if it was not moving at all, all right? And this S intrinsic is divided by gamma into one minus beta cosine phi, and the whole thing is raised to the power of N plus alpha. Sorry, there seems to be an extra bracket over here, just ignore that, okay? So you can see if phi is small, that will be closer to one, okay, cos zero is one, but cos five or so would be close, close to one, but uh, not quite one, and beta is also very high. So this number becomes very, very small. So even if you multiply it by the corresponding Lorentz factor, this would be much smaller than one. So when this is much smaller than one, and you again raise it, uh, this n is a bit model dependent, it's two or three, uh, for okay, and alpha is a spectral index, which is about say about one for most purposes. So you can see this can this gets raised to raised to the power of three. So that gives rise to a large increase in the observed flux density, and this happens for the approaching one. For the receding one, the same factors will actually decrease the observed flux density. So if you get a ratio, if you get the ratio of the observed of the approaching one to the receding one, this will be one plus beta cosine phi upon one minus beta cosine phi to the, end, the power of n plus alpha. Now, if I take n equal to two, which seems more appropriate for jets, then if it is coming at the velocity of light or very close to the velocity of light at an angle of 20 degrees, I will get a flux density ratio of about 30,000 or so. So you can, you can see straight away now that if jets are moving at, at, at reasonably relativistic velocities of a fair fraction of the velocity of light at a, at a sort of inclined towards you at a reasonably small angle to the line of sight, then you would get a huge ratio of the approaching to the receding jets. And that is why the jets appear to be one-sided. The, the receding jet exists, but you're not being able to see it because it has been Doppler diminished. On the other hand, for the hotspots themselves, at the outer edges, the velocities are much lower. They're trying to push the interstellar medium. So it's only a small fraction of the velocity of light. So these effects, when the velocity becomes very small, are not important. And so the hotspots, you can see it on both sides, but you cannot see the, uh, you cannot see the, the jet appears asymmetric, although, uh, uh, so the uh, so the uh, 
uh, uh, sorry, uh, jet appears asymmetric because of the relativistic motion. There were two comments on the chat. Uh, is it not contradicting? It is not contradict contradicting special relativity because it is an apparent motion. Uh, apparent velocity might be more than that of light. That is true. It is the apparent velocity which is more than that of light. It is not the uh, not the velocity in the rest frame of the object. It is because the object is coming towards you. For example, if you think of a pulsar which is rotating, V equal to R omega, and if you take R to be very large, that spot will uh, move uh, can move at a velocity greater than that of light. But the thing is that that is not a physical velocity. That is not a velocity at which information is being is being sent from one place to another. So these are apparent velocities, and you have to keep that in mind. All right. So it doesn't uh, violate special relativity at all. Okay. Now, uh, for these uh, minuscule jets in the nuclei of active galaxies, we can try and measure the velocity because. Uh, because the velocities, because there are compact components in them, which we can measure, and whose motions are only on the scale of milli arc seconds, which we can sort of monitor. But if you take the large scale jets, where the jets have expanded out, these small scale milli arc second features are not visible at all. So there are no compact features because the motion is so small that you need a compact component to measure the motion. So if you look at the compact motion, then you will not be able to. Now, if you look at the large scale jets, these components don't exist. But the fact that the small scale jets and the large scale jets are moving, are usually in the same direction, uh, makes you believe that, hey, the same explanation may be working. So one way of testing that is to try and establish that uh, these large scale jets are also approaching us, all right? Now we do that by a very sort of neat experiment, which was done by Simon Garrington as part of his PhD thesis. The idea came from Robert Lang, okay? And it is known as the Lang-Garrington effect. So the, 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 this test is, uh, relies on uh, the fact that when you have electromagnetic radiation, which is linearly polarized and goes, and that linearly polarized signal goes through a magneto-ionic medium, the, position angle of the vector of the electric vector is going to change. Okay. And this is because you can see that uh, the, the E vector, a linearly polarized signal can be broken up into two oppositely circular polarized components, which will have different velocities to the medium and re resulting in a net rotation of the electric vector. This is proportional to square of the wavelength and and, 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 an, and a product, which is the integral of the electron density and a parallel component of the magnetic field. So if any is large, the rotation will be large. If B parallel is large, rotation will be large. And for same any B parallel, as you go to longer wavelengths, you will see more rotation, right? Now, and this integral over here is what is called a rotation measure, the integral of any B, uh, B parallel, and it measured in units of radians per meter squared. So that if you put wavelength in meter squared, you'll get a change in angle in radians, which you can convert to degrees. Now let's see, let's see what happens when, for example, the signal is going through a magnetoionic medium. Suppose, for, is, let me consider an ideal case where all the magnetic field is uniform, uh, a, an absolutely uniform idealized magnetic field, uh, and all the electric vectors are, say, in one direction. And this signal is going through a magnetic ionic medium and is, and is being observed by you on the Earth with a radio telescope. And let's say you're observing with a radio telescope whose beam or resolution element is about the sign of the square that I've, or you know, nearly a square that I've drawn over here. Now, this magneto ionic medium is going to consist of all kinds of irregularities. It's not going to be a uniform medium. Nature abhors uniformity. There will be different scale sizes of the irregularities with different electron densities. Magnetic fields would be in the, you know, different directions. So the parallel component is what will count. And when you, when you look at that, the different cells that it will go through, all the vectors will be rotated in different directions on, by different angles, given this formula over here, different any, different B parallel, even at the same wavelength. If you go to longer wavelengths, it will be rotated. Now you can imagine that when you average all this up within your beam, your polarization is going to drop. If it was just like this, let's say if it was 30% polarized, 
Here it could be just a few percent polarized, right? And this is the idea that one is going to use over here. For example, if this jet is coming towards you and there is an optical galaxy sitting over here, then the radiation from the northern lobe will pass through the magnetoionic plasma, whereas the southern lobe is not going to. It'll come directly towards you. As a result, when you go to longer wavelength, this is at six centimeters, the five gigahertz, which is six centimeters. This is longer wavelength where the vectors have been rotated a lot more. So as you can see, this is, these, are, these little dots over here are the polarization vectors. You can see over here, there is very little change as you go to smaller wavelengths, but here it has changed a lot. And this is what you exactly expect if there is a galaxy with a magnetoionic medium and a jet is coming towards you. And this sort of supports the idea. And this is what is plotted over here is the polarization at 20 divided by six, because 20 is low, these numbers are very small. Whereas here, it is all very close to about one because it has not passed through the magnetoionic medium associated with the host galaxy. So what we have over here is, is establishing the fact that the observed jet is on the, opposite, is on the approaching side. So this doesn't prove that it is moving. There are other arguments to show that it is probably moving at a fair fraction of the velocity of light, but much less than the 0.99c that we talked about for the nuclear jets. And then it deposits its energy in the outer hotspots. So jets are moving at velocities which are close to that of the velocity of light. And, and, and the galaxies and the hotspots appear symmetric, as I said, and that is because this is trying to push its way out through the interstellar and intergalactic medium uh, all the time, uh, whereas the plasma is flowing through a channel which it has already evacuated. So this, is, this moves at a much smaller velocity. So the relativistic effects which I talked about before explaining the jet asymmetry are far more modest. You can see that this hotspot is a little brighter than this hotspot. So there are mild relativistic effects which come in, but not at the level of the jet asymmetry. And remember, we calculated factors of thousands. You can see that the jet asymmetry from observations is, is, ob is observation in the limits on it are much smaller than, than the numbers which I just quoted from you. So even with modest velocities of 0.4, 0.5c or 0.3c, often you can explain the observed asymmetry in the, in the, in the jets. If you go make far deeper images today in the next generation of telescopes, some of the sources which don't show jets even with deep observations today may show it up. And one can use that to try and estimate what the velocities further on might be uh, by, by making intelligent guesses or intelligent estimates of what the orientation angle is. Okay, uh, so I will again take a short break over here before I come to the last part of my talk to just give you a hint of the energy generation uh, processes. So let me just check the chat. Uh, no, there's nothing new in the chat. So if you have any questions on the jet asymmetry, because uh, there, was, there were questions asked earlier um, in yesterday's class, and, uh, and, and so today we'll address those questions as well. And as you can see in fanorov Riley class one objects, the jets were reasonably symmetric. So those are jets which are moving at uh, very mildly relativistic velocities, if at all. They're low Mach number jets, very dissipative, and so they appear to be reasonably symmetric. But in the fanorov Riley class two sources, the jets are moving at very high velocities and our high Mach numbers are well collimated and these effects become important, okay. Let's, uh, take, let's take a couple, few questions now before we move. Uh, Anik Shivastav, you, uh, I'll just unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, my same question is uh, this. Uh, whether the black holes are in fixed in the space or they can wander around? Sorry, black, black holes are? Are they fixed uh, or they can wander? Like, uh, as you are saying that they are fixed at the center of the galaxy. The thing is that for anything to move, uh, there has to be a force exerted on it. These are very massive okay. objects. So, yes, for yes. example, uh, if there are interactions with other galaxies, the black oh. hole may, may, may get into sort of precession. But it will be very difficult to dislocate a black hole unless there are two sort of black holes or supermassive black holes which are... Oh. 
coalescing to form one black hole. These are very massive objects and you require the equivalent amount of force to actually move it. As, um, okay. So that usually is not there. So these reside in the nuclear or central region nuclei of active galaxies. Uh, but as I mentioned yesterday as well, um, due to interaction with companions or interactions or mergers with companion galaxies, that that they could there would be movements. There would be uh, there would be movements. Um, there could be precession of the of the black hole, manifesting itself in the precession of the jets when you uh, see the jets squirting out from the nucleus. All right. Oops. So there is one more question in the chat. Let me see what. Okay, Saru Upar is asking, sir, these jets and the supermassive black holes are the ones who are increasing the, uh, means those vanish, those vanish expansion, the universe stops. All galaxies have a quasar at the center, which is making the expansion. Um, actually, the thing is that if you look at, um, if you look at the fraction of masses of black holes, yesterday, uh, yesterday, um, uh, Shomak talked to you about uh, the baryonic matter component in the universe, right? And these black holes have also formed from baryonic matter. And that uh, contributes a relatively small fraction to the overall energy budget of the universe. Okay, So that is something which you have to keep in mind. Uh, all galaxies have equations in the center, uh, which is true. But again, the same sort of argument or comment which I mentioned earlier, uh, that holds. Okay, uh, So today we are in a dark energy dominated universe, uh, which uh, we don't know much about. Uh, if our current cosmology is correct, a lot of observational support is there for it. And, and the next major component is dark matter. And, and uh, dark matter, again, it interacts via gravitation. But again, it is something which we don't have very firm ideas about. So the overall uh, budget of the universe is dark energy, dark matter, and then baryonic matter. Uh, so yesterday, Shomuk, uh, uh, Shomuk Rajaudhri dealt quite a bit with that. And so you just reflect on, on, on that aspect of it when you think about the universe as a whole. Now, Ayush Garg asks, how, but how come galaxies move since black holes are a part of it? If black holes are not moving due to the due to external force. There are two aspects of it, okay? That when 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 a galaxy moves, for example, our galaxy is also moving in the in the local local group. I mean Andromeda is coming towards us, all right? So our galaxy, for example, if it has about 10 to the power of 11, 12 solar mass stars, the galaxy is only about, the black hole is only about 10 to the power of six. So the, so the black hole moves with the galaxy, but the galaxy will respond to the larger gravitational potential well in which it is residing. Our galaxy is part of the local group. And as you learned yesterday, again, from Shomuk's lectures, is that galaxies, all galaxies or most galaxies, some occur in very low density regions of voids, but bulk of galaxies are part of groups and often of rich clusters of galaxies. So galaxies are going to respond to the overall potential that they are moving in. And that is in addition to the Hubble expansion of the universe, because the universe itself is expanding. Uh, and the expansion of the universe expanding means that the metric of space-time is expanding. And the galaxies are a part of the metric of space-time. Okay, So the galaxy is sitting at the center, um, the center of it. I mean, you can imagine yourself sitting in a car, right? So if you're sitting in a car, the car is moving, but you're sitting stationary over there. So the galaxy is sitting, and the black hole is sitting in the center of the galaxy, and the whole galaxy is responding to a larger poten to potential when uh, potential of uh, its neighbors and the groups and the dark matter potential it is sitting with. Uh, he's asking uh, Tonmoy Patisa, how can we exceed light velocity? V equal to omega r, okay? Let me take a pulsar, for example, okay, which has a constant, say, angular velocity. And you're, you're, you're observing a pulsar, which is several, you know, many kiloparsecs away, say. So why don't you calculate what the velocity is for that point, okay? But the thing is that this is not a real velocity. This is not a velocity at which you're communicating information. It's a velocity at which a pulse is of light is just cutting you. So that is not... That is, that is not a maximum limit to the velocity of light as far as Einstein's theory is concerned, okay? You're not, you're not propagating information. But you put in the angular velocity of a pulsar and you put in a large distance and see what kind of Vs you get, okay, Tanmay? Okay, now, uh, okay, if, uh, okay, there is one more question, we'll take that, otherwise we'll run out of time, it's 10.51, okay? 
Uh, there's one more question. Let's see what the chat is. Okay. Don't mind just says thank you. All right. Okay. So now <clears throat> we'll come to the last part of the talk and then we will uh, take uh, questions as well. Right. Now let's, let's try and understand what we have said so far. What have we said so far? We have said that we need black holes to get the high efficiencies and the energies that are required for these active galaxies where jets are carrying these energies to the outer lobes of emission. And um, we have not yet come to this, how these jets are launched. And we also mentioned about uh, accretion disks being formed around black holes because matter when it infalls will have a certain angular momentum. Uh, although in idealized theoretical situations, one may talk about uh, spherical asymmetric accretion, but matter will have an angular momentum as it accretes. So you'll have an accretion disk uh, around the black hole. Uh, so we have a black hole addressed with an accretion disk, and we have seen these powerful luminous jets associated with active galaxies. To understand the huge energies, we need the black holes. And uh, black holes will necessarily have to be addressed with an accretion disk because matter will have an angular momentum associated with it. We have not brought in magnetic fields so far with the accretion disk, but that will be an important component in trying to understand the formation of jets and the whole sort of uh, physics of what is going on right in the vicinity of the supermassive black holes. So today, actually, I will not overload you, but I will just try and historically trace uh, some of the seminal papers or salient uh, seminal papers trying to attempt to understand relationships between black holes, disks, and jets, okay? And it is also a lesson on how probably science develops by trying, are trying out different things. So far, we have only said that black holes are required. Is it a sufficient condition? We don't really know right now, okay? Now, one of the early suggestions that there could be a common mechanism for the generation of jets, okay, via black holes, dressed with an accretion disk, came from a paper which was written by uh, Steve Rawlings and Richard Saunders from Cambridge. So what they calculated was the jet power, okay? Bulk kinetic power of the jet. So the bulk kinetic power of the jet would be less than the radial luminosity because the radial luminosity really traces only the emission from the relativistic electrons which are emitting synchrotron emission. But in addition, you have protons which are also there. They could be other ions. And these are moving at bulk uh, with, with, with uh, you know, high, with moderate sort of, with relativistic velocities. And so, so the bulk kinetic power in the jet would be lower than the radial luminosity. And how do we calculate the total bulk kinetic power? What they did was they took the total energy in the low. Uh, and yesterday we talked about the equipartition energy. So they calculated the equipartition energy and they also, which is uh, assuming that uh, radio emission is due to synchrotron, which is a reasonable, a reasonable assumption. And the kinetic power is given by the total energy divided by some efficiency power process, which allows for work done on the external medium and the age of the lobe. And although there are caveats to it, the age of the lobe can be estimated uh, by a break in the, or a steepening of the non-thermal synchrotron spectrum. Why? because the higher energy electrons will radiate faster, uh, radiate faster. So depending upon where the break occurs, you can get a rough estimate of the, of the age of the lobe. So they did that and calculated the bulk kinetic power in the jet, right? And then they wanted to see if that is related to the disk. And for the disk, you can't really directly see the disk. Uh, so they use, so people, so astronomers use various proxies for it. Here they use the narrow line luminosity because the line can be uh, ionized by photons, hot, uh, high energy photons, which originate from the hot accretion disks. Okay, so within the narrow region, within the close to about a few kiloparsecs, uh, they could be ionized by the hot, uh, uh, high energy photons coming out from the accretion disk itself. So the luminosity of the LNR, the narrow line region close to the black hole, accretion disk, is what they have used to uh, get a proxy for the jet luminosity, right? Now, there are caveats to it here as well. So it's not surprising that there would be a scatter because even 
For example, when the jet is flowing outwards, uh, some of it could be also shock ionized. And as we saw in one of the pictures, you could delineate by looking at line ratios to see what is shock ionization, what is photo ionization, etc. But 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 leaving those caveats aside, what they found was a relationship between jet power and total narrow line luminosity for a whole range of extragalactic objects. All right, these are sources which they took of very powerful luminous jets, both Fanerol Friday class one, class two, and and you can see that there is a very significant relationship between the two. And so that that sort of told you that hey, perhaps the jet power is related to the disk in some form. But we don't really know the physics of it. That is not what we're probing right now. And that will not really have time to probe in, this, in, this, uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, because I will not touch upon the physics of accretion disks. Uh, there is not enough time to do that. But I will just try to highlight some of the results. Okay? So jet power and narrow line luminosity relationship of powerful radio sources. Okay? So this, app, this is applicable to sources which have, which are luminous radio sources. And as I mentioned yesterday, that if you take a volume of elliptical galaxies, only about 10% or so have such powerful jets. The rest do not, okay? So radio quiet or radio weak objects with prominent emission lines would not follow this relationship. For example, even if I take quasars, only 10% are radio loud. But all quasars have prominent emission lines. So, so perhaps something more than is required. And Steve Rawlings and Richard Saunders speculated that massive spinning black hole which powers the jets and controls the accretion. So they have brought in not only mass, but also spin of the black hole, okay? But at a fundamental level, we got to understand what triggers the formation of radio jets occurring. And that is related to the whole question of only why only 10% seem to be very luminous and the others are radio weak or radio quiet. And that dichotomy, one has to understand in terms of the physics of what are the governing physical principles or physical processes, as well as physical properties, which trigger the formation of these large scale jets. Well, before going into that, I just want to highlight one relation to you, uh, which is often referred to as a Megorian relationship that all galaxies with a bulge have a supermassive black hole sitting in the center of it. And the greater the mass of the black hole, greater is the mass of the central bulge, and greater is the mass of the central bulge, the greater is the velocity dispersion of the stars itself. And that is applicable to whether you're talking of elliptical galaxies, lenticular galaxies, spiral galaxies, it does not matter as long as there is a bulge, which spiral galaxies have, elliptical galaxies sometimes a whole elliptical is a bulge, but this relationship is pretty strong and well established. Here is another sort of uh, uh, picture of it with more objects put in. Uh, this, uh, this, this whole study originated from a paper by Megorian uh, et al. in 1998 and it's referred to as Megorian relationship. So, so, so all galaxies with a bulge have a supermassive black hole. Many may exhibit low level of activity, but only small fraction are radio loud. So although we require a supermassive black hole to, to have the high levels of efficiency for generating these jets, clearly that by itself is not enough. You might argue that, okay, perhaps you need to feed them. It's only when you feed them that you get these powerful jets and otherwise you do not. So one sort of argument which says that is probably not the whole story, but also maybe part of the story, uh, is that uh, the number, the amount of mass which you require is not huge. If you calculate the Eddington luminosity, you'll get mass required mass rates of about you know two to three solar masses per year, uh, per year to generate about ten to the power of forty six hertz per second. And radio loudness is often defined as the ratio of LR the radio luminosity at say five gigahertz to the optical luminosity, maybe the blue luminosity. Sometimes people take the bolometric luminosity. Then this factor might change a little bit as well. Okay. Now, along with that, okay, keeping that in mind, people try to investigate relationships between black hole mass, accretion rate, and spin of the black hole. 
a fundamental play and also magnetic fields which may play a role. A major development or a significant development was recognized a fundamental plane of black hole activity. This was done by Andrew Maloney et al. And, uh, um, and this was in 2003. And, uh, and you can see over here that this tries to use, this particular study used X-ray luminosity as a proxy for the disk luminosity, okay, uh, for the disk. And, and you can find that uh, the relationship when you factor in both the radio luminosity, the X-ray luminosity, and the mass of the black hole forms a very tight correlationship. It forms a correlation not only from galactic X-ray binaries, so you can see Sagittarius A star, the center of our Milky Way, M32 over here, and then you have these powerful quasars and Seaford galaxies over there. So across many orders of magnitude, okay, of luminosity, you have a fundamental relationship between radio luminosity, X-ray luminosity, and mass of the black hole. So this again tells you that the disk and the mass are related to the product of the jets, jet production. Okay. Today, in this like in these two couple of lectures, we will just look at, we'll not look much about the theoretical, except I may mention it, but we'll just look at how observers have tried to probe relationships, or astronomers have tried to probe and establish a relationship uh, to try and understand how jets may form. So clearly the disk and the mass are important. But is that the whole story? Okay, and that is something we will try to see. This one, this is another study establishing the same relationship, but these authors like uh, Rawlings and Saunders did, by Sonisaikia, Elmer Koring and Heino Falke, they, try, they use the O3 luminosity, okay? Uh, the oxygen three luminosity. This is the forbidden transition lines of doubly ionized oxygen and the mass of the black hole to again establish a strong relationship between radio core emission they took over here, accretion disk, and the black hole mass. Okay, so these are related. But now we can ask ourselves the question: Is there all to it? All right. And when you do that, what we find is as follows. So we'll spend about five minutes doing this, and then we will take a few questions. Okay. That relates to uh, relates to the fact that a paper by Ari Lauer. Uh, this was in 2000. And what he did was he looked, he plotted the radio loudness, which is the 5 gigahertz flux density at radio versus the optical flux density at 4,400 angstroms for 87 quasars. Now, what he, what he found was that if you take the most massive black holes, there are, all of them are very radio loud. All right? So clearly, what he's trying to say is that to produce these jets, you need very massive black holes. But in the intermediate cases, you find that they're both radio loud and radio quiet. Some can launch it, some cannot launch it. And there seems to be some kind of a critical mass beyond which you're not able to launch these very luminous jets. And he estimates, or they, he estimates a number, Arilar estimates the number is three into 10 to the power of eight solar masses or so, all right? But this has been contested. This has been contested because you do have quasars. This is a more recent paper by Marco Schiabarghi and Alessandro Marconi, which says that, well, there are objects which are radio quiet, are less than two. These are radio quiet quasars, all right? Radio quiet quasars, which are uh, very luminous, which are, which are very massive black holes. So just having massive black holes may be a necessary condition, but it is not a sufficient condition, all right? And these two plots basically show the same thing from different samples, that if you have low, uh, the radio quiet objects, log R less than two, uh, okay, R less than two, and uh, then uh, log of radio to optical luminosity, then then they, they generally don't, do, don't tend to have massive black holes. This is from a large sample of STSS uh, objects. Okay, but what we're learning now is that a black hole, a massive black hole is required to launch these more luminous jets, but again, it is not a sufficient condition. Okay, so what else could it be? 
Then we come to the idea of a spin of a black hole. Okay, and there have been theoretical models where you know uh, the spinning up the magnetic field, threading the inner regions of the accretion disk, can give rise to you know building up stresses which eject matter along uh, the polar axis. Um, uh, mechanisms of e extraction of energy have been worked out by Blanford and Janik and Blanford and Pale, Payne, and these models have been developed uh, by others as well, David Meyer being one of them. Okay, so, so I'll briefly touch upon, uh, upon what, you, what you mean by the spin of a black hole. So basically what happens is that the black hole itself is a singularity, but material within the black hole that, uh, that goes beyond the event horizon could have angular momentum with it. And when it is spinning, when a black hole is, or single black hole is spinning, then it drags the reference material, the whole, um, not only material, light, the space-time frame along with it, uh, space-time continuum along with it, rotating the space-time will drag matter and even light into rotation. And it is from this area, which is called the ergosphere, comes from a Greek word called ergon, which means work, and that you can extract energy very efficiently. So there's a lot of energy which is, which is residing in the spin of the black hole. Let me skip this. And there are various ways of measuring the spin of the black hole as well. And I've just illustrated one over here, is that depending upon the spin of the black hole, you can see that this, uh, that this, uh, uh, that this um, event horizon actually, it, it can get closer to the black hole, it shrinks. And then the light which comes out from the inner regions of the equation, this the, the innermost stable circular orbit will get closer. So you can see effects of it in the emission lines which you see from the disk itself. These emission lines are highly ionized lines on, from, uh, from iron. Uh, and, and from the profiles, you can try and estimate the spin. So we'll not get into too much of details, but let me tell you that observationally, it is a challenging thing to do. But using different techniques, people have determined the spin of the black hole. And so the idea now is that along with spin, perhaps the most massive black holes is what is required to trigger these jets. Now, when you look at the measurements of spin, most seem to be maximally rotating, but these could be you know, subject to selection effects as well, because it may be easier to measure the spins of the maximally rotating ones. The maximum value of A is one. Uh, for retrograde, prograde, uh, it ranges from minus one to plus one, but the modulus over here is one. Okay, and and then you can ask yourself whether that is, that itself is sort of uh, will give you the answer. Now, in terms of measuring spin alone being the cause, there were sort of arguments put out against it by saying that we have maximally rotating black holes. And these are two of the examples of Seaford galaxies, which are rotating very fast, okay? Uh, this is almost close to one. This is also close to one. And, but the thing is that the black hole masses are small. They're only a few million times the mass of our sun. So it appears now that along with spin, along with mass, both are required to produce these luminous jets. But the numbers are just small. And we still have to go a long way in trying, in trying to understand the production of jets from it. But if you look at, for example, this figure, which puts the power in the jets versus the power in the disk, you can see that, uh, you can see that this is the line where the power in the jet is uh, equal to the power in the disk. And all the points lie above it, almost all the points, except a stray one over here. So there's a lot of power in the jets much beyond what is available in the disk. So, uh, so it is not unreasonable to assume that you're tapping energy also from the rotation of the disk. And magnetic fields have, have an important role to play because once you churn these things up and create the right sort of topology or field structures to be able to collimate and launch the jets um, in, in the, from the vicinity of the black holes. So I think I'll probably uh, stop at that. And, uh, and there are some questions in the chat, so let me try and take that first, and then we will come to uh, the questions over here. Okay, will you please refer to some stuff? Okay, let me try and go back. Uh, could, could uh, okay, let me, why don't we see, see jets for, okay. Let me try and answer these questions. Uh, okay, from Rabiul Islam, 
who is asking, why don't we see jets for supermassive black holes of our galaxy? Um, it is possibly because uh, it is not massive enough. So if these ideas are correct, uh, there may be very faint weak jets, okay? Very faint weak jets, which have not been able to pick up, but the luminous kind of jets, which, uh, which are seen in radio galaxies and quasars, it is both, uh, as we saw, it is probably both due to a combination of mass as well as spin, but, uh, but our black hole, the, the, super, the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is, is a bit too small, is, is a puny little one. So they could be very weak jets, but they would be weak jets, not the kinds of jets that we talked about for radio galaxies and quasars. Now, Suriji Chakrabarti asks, could there be any other pair of jets from an AGN which we are not able to see? Okay, from an AGN we are not able to see. It is possible, uh, it is possible. Um, there are two, uh, two aspects which you'll have to bear in mind. For example, when I said S observed is equal to S intrinsic divided by gamma into one minus beta cosine phi to the power of N plus alpha, uh, the, the, the Doppler boosted uh, sort of jets, if you put that angle phi equal to 90 degrees, you'll get S observed equal to S intrinsic divided by the bulk Lorentz factor of the jet gamma into N plus alpha. So if a jet is entirely on the plane of the sky, then the, then the Doppler, then the jets will be Doppler diminished, both of them. And if there is very little dissipation in those jets, as we see in FR class two radio sources, then there could be an AGN over there, there could be a core, there could be an X-ray source, but we may not be able to see the jets because of Doppler boosting and very little dissipation of energy in the jets. So that is, uh, that is not, uh, that is, so that is possible, all right? Now, Asha Chaturvedi has asked, how long do these jets last? Okay. Now, the thing is that uh, these jets last, you can estimate the time scales uh, for, uh, for, from the spectral aging arguments of synchrotron jets, or you can estimate time scales of how long do these jets last and then switch off from these uh, sources which show epi epi episodic sort of cycles of activity, where there are different pairs of radio lobes. So from estimates which have been made in different cases, there seems to be a wide range from you know million years or less to about 100 million years or so. So they could, they could be very long lasting jets. For example, in one of the jets which I showed you today, NGC 6251, the giant radio galaxy, we still see a jet which is connecting the core right to the, the, the hot spot over there. So the time scales are wide, uh, a wide range in different uh, time scales, much less than a few million years to, uh, to 100 million years or so. Okay. Now, uh, Junik Sengupta has asked, sir, could you please refer to some study material on this? Okay, I will try and put it on the web right now. Okay, uh, I've actually once I shared a uh, uh, shared uh, slide, you'll also find quite a few other references, but I'll also put in some basic textbook material as well. Okay, how does spin affect the strength of black hole jets in general? Okay, in some papers it. Um, it is mentioned the spin alters it. It said it has no effect on jets. Okay. Now the thing is that it it a lot depends on 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 where the mag magnetic fields are, uh, what role it plays in terms of the very basis of the accretion process itself, and what the spin do to the black hole itself, uh, to the to the geometry itself. Okay. Uh, because when uh, when uh, the, the black hole is spinning. Um, in the ergosphere, uh, it carry the magnetic fields along with it as well. So it's a question of it's a question of the geometry that one is trying to uh, trying to sort of see in terms of launching the jets. So in the in the in the in, in the most popular in the popular version of the Blanford-Janik model, you have magnetic fields which are playing a, a significant role in the formation uh, of the of the jets which are coming out from the black hole. Now, there are also complex processes which are going on in the center. And, and you can ask yourself that we talked about the black hole, but exactly at what point is the jet launched? Okay, if you go very close to the black hole, it'd be difficult to get out of its potential. So jets are perhaps launched a little higher than, than, than right near the surface of the black hole. Uh, so those are, those are aspects which, uh, which we still don't, it's fair to say that we still don't understand completely, but there has been a lot of progress in the last several years. And one of, the, one of the articles which actually summarizes a recent understanding of this uh, is in the annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics 
by Roger Blanford, Meyer, and Tony, David Meyer and Tony Reader. And that appeared just uh, last two years ago, 2019, I think. Okay? Okay. Uh, Matt, I read that uh, outflow efficiency is solely depend upon spin rate of the black hole and angular density thickness of the accretion flows. Now, actually, the thing is that, um, uh, I mean, th th there, are, there are different models for the accretion process itself. The magnetically arrested disk is one such scenario. Uh, there are different kinds of... Uh, uh, kinds of uh, um, accretion disks and accretion flows uh, which have been talked about for different kinds of active galaxies. Uh, so actually maybe we can discuss this offline because I haven't touched upon uh, the different kinds of accretion disks as well and I could also send you uh, some references. But, um, but, basically, uh, but basically the accretion process could be different in different kinds of AGN. Uh, for example, even for Fanner of Riley class two and class one objects, uh, the, the, there could be differences in the accretion disk structure and the accretion process. Okay. Uh, let me see. Such in the Direction of spin of black holes and jets are, are specific or it's a different for different black holes and different jets. Okay. We believe that the jets come out along the spin axis of the black hole, or, or along the spin axis. Okay. And and the jet axis is also related. I mean, over here, uh, we are measuring the spin uh, from the from from the uh, profiles of the uh, so say emission line at X-ray wavelengths. Uh, we also model the uh, X-ray lumina, X-ray emission brightness, and try to see how far you are getting to the innermost stable circular orbit. And from that, you try and infer how rapidly the uh, the black hole is spinning. But the fact that uh, there is a fundamental axis uh, to the direction of the jets also comes from uh, optical observations of ionization cones. For example, the basic structure of a disk or torus around the black hole will prevent all the photons from coming in the innermost regions uh, to go out isotropically, but will be confined to two cones on opposite sides. And the jets are exactly uh, in the, along the axis of these cones. And these axes seem to have no relationship to the overall axis of the galaxy. For example, if I take spiral galaxies and Seaford galaxies, the jets have no relation to the minor axis of the Seaford galaxy. Jets could be at any angles. So there is an axis of, the, of emission. Uh, there is an axis of the spin, but it may not be related at all to the overall geometry or the minor axis of the galaxy. Okay. Now, Sauro Uparik, so can we think in reverse direction that the supermassive black hole and magnetars, quasars are like the button in the space-time curvature and resisting from somehow the stretching of space-time so many billion, billion galaxies are. Actually, the thing is that it is like this, that uh, uh, it's like this. Uh, if I have a compact object, let, let me take even a pencil, okay? You put it in space. I mean, the thing is that the whole, sp the, the, the the, the, the object that you're talking about is an object embedded in the space-time matrix. So the expansion of the universe is going to take place. The expansion of the, the universe is expanding. The matrix of space-time is expanding. So the galaxies are moving away from, or appear to move away from each other because the matrix of space-time is expanding. So it's not that a black hole is resisting the expansion of the universe. The black hole is a gravitationally bound system, which is also taking part in the expansion of the universe. Okay? And the black, the, black hole, the black hole is embedded in the galaxy. It's lying in the center of the galaxy. And the galaxy is moving away from it. So there is no question of a quasar or a supermassive black hole resisting the, ex, resisting the expansion of the universe. They're all taking part in the expansion of the universe. Okay? Okay, let me... Okay, we'll have to stop at some point. Otherwise, I will run into uh, Shomuk's time. All right? So let me, let me just take quickly. Otherwise, I will try and answer you in the uh, chat box, okay? Uh, are there any hands up? Uh, no, I don't see any hands up. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Um, do I, okay. So I think I've sort of addressed most of the questions in the chat. Uh, if, there is, if there is somebody present from yesterday who had a quick question, we could just take it quickly. 
because I don't want it to run into too much time, right? Okay. Otherwise, we'll uh, we will actually. Can I take a gallery shot today? Would would you all uh, briefly put on your cameras? Would you would you all uh, briefly put on your videos? Can you briefly put on your videos? Oh, okay, restricted by the host. Okay, let me see. Can I do that? Uh, let me see. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me let me see if I can quickly do it. Otherwise, we will. Uh, okay, maybe maybe we'll try it. And let me just try because it's getting late. Uh, let me see if I can do it. Okay, I am a co-host, so maybe the host has to do it. I'm not able to do it. Uh, not able to do it. Okay, okay, we will try. We'll try and take it in the evening. I'll talk to the host, and uh, then we will uh, do it. All right. Okay. Thanks very much. Take a short break, and then uh, uh, Shomak will start in about ten minutes' time. All right. Take care. All the best. Yeah. And if you have any further questions, just put it uh, in that uh, Google sheet, or you can for for faculty members, you could put it in the discussion forum in the Moodle page as well. All right. Uh, take care. All the very best. Thanks. Thanks for all the questions.